So good morning, everyone, and to our friends and colleagues based in Asia or in Europe. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Central Asia Program Seminars. My name is Sebastian Perus. I'm the director of the Central Asia Program, that's the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. So we have today an exceptional panel. I mean, we have three renowned experts, Ms. Jocelyn Brown Hall, Dr. Suresh Babu, and Ambassador Muster to address uh, an essential topic, which is uh, food security in Central Asia. I mean, food security has raised many questions since uh, the independence of Central Asian countries. And uh, for example, recently a survey which was conducted by uh, the World Bank uh, in 2021 and 2022 showed that food security in Central Asia was the biggest concern compared to other measures of poverty. Uh, and well, of course, uh, many elements are impacting food uh, security. This includes uh, climate change. Uh, Central Asia, as you probably know, is one of the regions which is going to be the most impacted by climate change. But uh, we need also to include other factors, where, for example, the impact potential the possible impact of Russia's war in Ukraine, which has caused some uh, supply chain disruptions and uh, so food prices have soared uh, already in several countries of the region. So today, uh, this seminar will address uh, different issues related to food security, the factors likely to have a negative or maybe positive impact on food security, how may also governments respond to this risk and other questions that our three speakers who are such specialists in this matter consider uh, relevant. Uh, we're going to talk about Central Asia as a whole, but also uh, taking into account that despite a certain common historical and cultural background, uh, the countries of uh, the, the region are at the same time different, and I would say even getting more and more different. So we decided to focus today on two case studies, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. Uh, we will probably organize another seminar focusing on the other countries in the region in the, in the coming weeks. So I would like to thank our three panelists for having uh, accepted to present, to be with us today in our, in our seminar. The three of uh, them have an extremely busy schedule, so thank you so much. So uh, our speakers will present about uh, 15 minutes. And after their presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So please uh, feel free to send your questions in the, the chat box. So thank you so much for being with, with us. We, and we're going to start with Ms. Uh, Jocelyn Brown. She's the director of the UN Food and Agricultural Organizations uh, Liaison Office from North America, which is based here in DC. Before, from 2019 to 2021, Ms. Brown uh, Hall was the deputy regional representative for the FAO's regional office for Africa, which is based in Accra in Ghana. And in this capacity, she oversaw 47 FAO country offices in Africa and guided the strategy and communications around food security, agriculture, climate change, agri-food trade, and animal and plant health, among other matters. And prior to joining the FAO, Ms. Brown Hall was uh, with the US Department of Agriculture, where she was appointed deputy administrator in the foreign agricultural service. And she led the USDA's two uh, 2 billion US dollars food and technical assistance program in low and middle income countries. So Jocelyn, thank you again for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate the interest. Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm gonna share my slide, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here and see if we can get this started here. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. I uh, hope everyone can see my screen. Um, I'm gonna do an overview of food security in Central Asia, uh, and um, but I need to zoom out a little bit. And before I start, I just wanna do two little tidbits about me and my connections to Central Asia. 
One is when I was 17 years old, my father, who um, was uh, very interested in, in Russia and, and, and then the Soviet Union, I'm a, I grew up during the time of the Cold War, um, decided that he wanted to take our family to Russia, uh, my sister and me, to Russia before what we thought was getting a, a real freeze um, in the uh, Russo-US relations. And so my dad took us to uh, um, Uzbekistan um, and Tajikistan in 1983. Um, and I haven't been back since, so I really need to go back and compare and contrast. Um, and then after that, I was a Peace Corps volunteer on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I, uh, so I am very familiar with Afghanistan uh, as part of Central Asia. So I wanna back out um, in terms of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, while we are the oldest specialized technical agency of the UN, our vision is not well known often and it's a world free from hunger and malnutrition where food and agriculture contribute to improving the standard livings of all, especially the poorest. Um, and noting that agriculture touches e e economics, uh, social issues and environmental issues as well. Um, I wanted to point out, uh, you can see on the right over here, the globe over here on the right, the, um, the pinpoint is where our headquarters is in Rome, but you can see here that we've got quite a few offices in Central Asia, uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, Uzbekistan, uh, where we actually have a lot of coverage in this area. Um, and to, to put the food security context of Central Asia uh, into perspective, I think it's important to uh, demonstrate globally where we are. So I think it's no a surprise that world hunger has risen um, in 2000, since 2021 following the pandemic um, and that we uh, unfortunately have a, an upsweep upswing in hunger rather than a downswing. We had a downswing for, for many, many years uh, until the pandemic and the subsequent economic downturn. Uh, inequalities have been widened by the pandemic. And now we have almost 2.3 billion people lacking adequate food. In 2021, we don't have the 2022 complete numbers. Uh, they'll come out uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we're not on track to achieving our global uh, targets and Almost half the world cannot afford a healthy diet, which is a very shocking um, uh, statistic. Here we have our hunger map. Um, dark is bad, light is good. Um, and you can see in Central Asia, um, there's a, a, a variety of different uh, colors there. Obviously Afghanistan is, you know, down there with one of the most food insecure countries um, in the world. Over 55% of the population in Afghanistan right now is receiving some sort of food assistance uh, through UN or other NGOs. Um, but Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, uh, there are some other um, uh, uh, food insecurities. They're lighter, of course. Um, if it's uh, right now, we see Kazakhstan is, is pretty food secure. Uh, so that's a big country up here. Um, but you can see there's a real um, diversity just within this region uh, of, of food insecurity. And this is, of course, I want to point out that this is a specific indicator of prevalence of undernourishment, um, meaning people are not getting enough calories. Uh, there's a lot of different indicators for food insecurity, but this one is particularly sort of calories in, calories out. It does not count types of calories or illness from foodborne diseases or things like that. Um, so here's another chart on food insecurity. Unfortunately, it's only updated through 2020. Um, any people who work in economics and statistics in uh, food security know that there's always a delay in kind of gathering the information and there's always a challenge of getting the information itself. So you can see here a gap here um, in uh, the caucuses, for example, on food insecurity. We just didn't get the information from the countries. Um, but, you know, I talked earlier about how food insecurity has been coming down, the prevalence of undernourishment is coming down, and then you can see this uptick. This is 2020 and it's been going up further. 
Um, and of course, uh, this is uh, food prices affect food insecurity. Um, these are the food price indexes, the most recent ones we have um, around uh, that demonstrate what's been happening around not just COVID, but the war in Ukraine. Um, and these the, on the left, you see food prices increasing um, uh, a little bit um, towards the end of each year, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. But I think the, the main point on the, on, the, on the slide on the left is that there's a big, huge slight spike in food prices, which obviously affects, and these are global food prices, which obviously affects um, Central Asia. Food. So big spike coming down, but still very, very high compared to uh, 2019 and 2020. And on the right side, you can see it by commodity. And I know we'll talk more about cereals in future presentations, but you can still see um, the increases there um, uh, in, in the overall trend lines going up in terms of uh, the, the prices of individual commodities, which again, all of these meat, dairy, cereals, oils, and sugars are basics uh, in Central Asia. Okay, for some reason my, here we go. Um, I want to talk about fertilizer. It's obviously a really important issue in Central Asia. Uh, Russia, as people probably know well, that um, fertilizer is, uh, Russia is a major supplier of fertilizer. And this graph shows something that I think you already are into it or have heard of is that with fertilizer affordability significantly down, obviously that affects um, uh, the, with the affordability down, it affects the um, ability for the crops to, you know, the yields. It affects um, uh, what what farmers can afford and what they can plant. And um, many crops are fertilizer intensive. Uh, one that we're watching right now, which um, doesn't affect Central Asia that much, but could rattle food prices in general, is rice, because rice is very uh, fertilizer intensive. So that will affect Africa more so than Central Asia. But again, you know, when one commodity spikes in price, then there's substitutes that occur in other commodities and it, it sort of upsets the apple cart on a lot of different fronts. So I talked about how uh, FAO is actually has presence. We have offices in, all, in Central Asia, throughout Central Asia. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the kinds of work that we're doing in Central Asia. Um, we are um, on the right hand side, we have um, looking at wheat management and prevention of wheat rust. Uh, if you know Central Asia at all, you know wheat is the staple crop. I understand my uh, one of the speakers, Ambassador Mustard, is going to talk about wheat a little bit more, but um, getting wheat varieties that are uh, higher yielding and are resistant to diseases such as uh, wheat rust, which has increased due to climate change, these are important research and technical assistance um, uh, opportunities that need to get out to farmers um, in these countries. And then on the left-hand side, you're looking at farm field schools and bringing up uh, future farmers in Tajikistan um, with new seed varieties, with uh, rotation of crops, we have a long, long history, over 50 year history of providing technical assistance to farmers in, in various areas, including in, in Central um, Asia to get the right crop at the right time. One of the things that the war in Ukraine has uh, highlighted is uh, the fact that we have very antiquated and outdated soil maps uh, worldwide, but also in Central Asia. And uh, the soil maps actually tell you what fertilizer you need. So if we can fill in the data around the soil maps, then we can fill, we can help farmers use uh, more targeted and possibly less fertilizer, which would then uh, go back to addressing that fertilizer affordability issue that I mentioned earlier. So, I would like everyone to save the date. Um, uh, well, there was uh, the, there's the launch of the food security and nutrition in Europe and Central Asia, which covers all the countries that we're talking about for 2022. I mentioned that we don't have the 2022 numbers out yet, and that will be coming this month. So I encourage everyone to um, 
uh, participate in that. If you need more information about that, we will put um, my uh, email and our website online. There will be a launch for this and uh, you can get deeper numbers um, uh, on specifics and food insecurity from that report. So I think that is the end of my presentation. I didn't take 15 minutes, but hopefully I can yield my time to uh, my esteemed colleagues and or yield my time to uh, guests who have questions. So thank you so much for including me and I uh, look forward to hearing uh, the other presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin, for, for your presentation, for, for sharing uh, for sharing that, uh, the, uh, this link. And uh, now we're going to have uh, Dr. Suresh Babu, uh, who is the head of capacity strengthening at the International Food, Sec Food Policy Research Institute and extraordinary professor at the Univers University of Pretoria in South Africa. Dr. Babu is guiding the IRF. BRI, the regional and country programs in their institutional and human capacity development activities. Uh, and in this leadership uh, position and as a collaborating researcher of the consultative group on international agricultural research program on climate change, uh, agriculture and food security, Dr. Babu has conducted many national dialogues leading to the development of uh, national food security and climate change policies of several developing countries in Africa and Asia, including India, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, Tajikistan, and Bhutan. And Dr. Babu has trained several uh, senior policy researchers and policymakers in South and Central Asian countries who are currently leading policy making positions directly influencing and shaping food and agricultural policy. So Dr. Babu, thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you uh, for including me as well in this panel. Um, it's a pleasure to join. Um, I'm trying to share the screen. Um, hope it yeah, comes it's up. working. It is. Okay. Now, um, since you can see the screen, I, I want to actually bring a different dimension to this, uh, this dialogue this morning. Um, I will go straight into Tajikistan as a country and also <clears throat> straight into the issues related to climate change. Uh, that has implications for food systems um, development. Um, and uh, in the context of food systems uh, um, and its implications for, you know, and the uh, uh, climate change implications of on the food systems, it's very important to understand what's happening at the country level. And, and it's one level uh, at the regional level and, and global level, we can understand the broader aspects of climate change but when it comes to making changes, policy changes, institutional changes, regulatory changes, and you know, uh, uh, in particularly issues related to food security and agriculture, it is very important to understand uh, what's happening at the country level. In this, in this context, what I'm presenting is related to Tajikistan and, and how we are working together with the, the USAID mission there, as well as the government of Tajikistan, the Committee on um, uh, Environmental Protection. I'll just give you the flavor and then see how various sectors come together, including agriculture and food uh, uh, sectors uh, and water sector come together to play a critical role in terms of developing, uh, on the one hand, climate smart agriculture, on the other hand, the climate induced water management system that, uh, that's very fundamental for improving food systems as we go along and also building the resilience of the food systems uh, as, as we build on uh, the existing cropping and, and, and farming systems. Uh, and in this context, I'll give you some flavor of uh, what we are doing in Tajikistan. And so this, con this presentation is quickly to give you the flavor on, on climate change implications on food systems, but what we are actually doing on the country. For example, uh, with working with the USAID mission, which is very supportive of the climate change actions on the ground, uh, and other development partners in Tajikistan. And we have been able to establish a, a NDC secretariat. NDC is basically nationally determined contributions and Tajikistan has defined its, its kind of plans in order to address climate change issues. And of course, um, we kind of come in to help technically 
to support the NDC secretariat in order to define the strategies that are already there in, into action on the ground. So in, in that context, we are able to also connect the work that we are doing at the regional level, in the Central Asia region level, as well as at the global level. And, and one example is the COP27, uh, where Tajikistan participated. And in the process, uh, uh, this whole process is driven by evidence uh, and, and evidence generation. Uh, the priority setting is driven by the evidence. What is happening on the ground? Who is doing what? Who are the actors and players who are contributing to climate change action? And how we can bring them together in order in a coordinated manner so that that, that action uh, that we put in, in place as a sustainable element so that it can take on, on its own. So that is the broad background to it. So I'm giving a little bit of that uh, uh, background so that you can appreciate what exactly is needed. In the context of climate change, uh, we do have a broader program called CASI Asia. That is uh, USAID uh, uh, funded and, and programmed um, comprehensive action for climate change initiative and in the Asia, it's a global program actually, but we kind of take that Asian perspective uh, and bring in Tajikistan specifically an approach that maps out the policy system in terms of partners and institutions, what are the resources available, who are the stakeholders involved in this process in the context of implementation of the uh, national adaptation, adaptation plans and national nationally determined contributions. And, and of course, establishing the institutions in building the institutional capacity is fundamental for taking the, the policy strategy and the investment plans to, to action on the ground. And in that context, the role of analytical capacity becomes very important. How do you analyze the existing data uh, uh, on climate change and its impact on food systems, for example? And what are the priorities that needs to be set in terms of limited in investments that we have, but we need to get action on the ground, see the progress on the ground and impact on the ground to build resilience, to, to implement the, for example, in the agricultural sector, what is the climate smart agriculture programs that we can implement on the ground. So in that context, it's also becoming important that we monitor, track and report what is happening on the ground, right? So we are trying to help in all aspects of this, this what I mentioned in the last one minute or so, how can the government capacity can be built? How can the partners capacity can be built so that we can actually implement the programs, monitor the programs and refine the programs as we, as we go along? So that's the kind of uh, approach we are taking in Tajikistan. And in, in fact, for Cassie Asia whole, as a whole, Tajikistan becomes a model uh, kind of approach. In that context, I should say, uh, uh, in addition to what we are doing in, in uh, um, Tajikistan, the starting point is the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions that are committed by the governments for the international community, nationally adapted, uh, national adaptation plans, for example. And we are looking at what are the information gaps right now in order to take these actions, uh, the, the strategies into action. And of course, analyzing the capacity gaps, uh, who is doing what and why the in implementation is lagging behind, for example, is it related to finance? or related to institutional reforms, or related to capacity of the people to actually take the knowledge and implement on the ground. So that's something that we need to really understand to start with as we as move, al move along in implementation, right? But more importantly, the investment becomes very important. What are the investments that are going into climate change? Tajikistan is a good example to actually study the, the costing of the investments. What are the priorities right now? How much this priorities are going to cost for the government and also for the development partners, right? But that requires bringing together, as we move, uh, as, as I talk, I will move, move along um, and the slides as well. So uh, that requires bringing actors and players together. That's what we did uh, uh, last year. In August, we brought various sectors together, various development partners together with the help of USAID mission there. Uh, we were able to kind of openly discuss about where Tajikistan stands in terms of climate action and who, are do, who is doing what and how can we bring the people together in order to implement the programs in a coordinated manner. But again, in, in all this, the government of Tajikistan and the secretariat, uh, NDC implementation secretariat is taking the lead, right? To bring, to bring the actors and players together. So we are providing this technical support and and, and the facilitation support for that, but but the the leadership really relies with the with the the, the country government and 
and the Center for uh, the, the Committee on Environmental Protection. And in that, one of the earliest actions that we have taken is to look at the sectoral plans and policies. For example, when we connect to climate change to food systems, we actually have to look at what is the agricultural strategy, for example, for the country? What is the food system strategy for the country? And how does that relate to climate change action? So we are now taking stock of that newly uh, you know, developed agricultural strategies of Tajikistan, looking at where the options are for us to synergetically develop quick impl implementation of actions on the ground and also impacts on the ground. Similarly, we are looking at the water sector. What is the Ministry of Irrigation and Water Management trying to do in terms of their own strategies and plans and how these plans are connected to the uh, implementation of NDCs uh, so that we can work together. So actually, just a plug in for where we are going to have a national workshop March 9th in, in uh, Dushan Bay on that particular integration of this sectoral strategies with the climate change action plans, right? So that gives us an understanding of how to one, set the priorities in various sectors, how to bring the multi-sectoral approach to climate change action, and how to cost-effectively invest uh, in climate change action. So having said that, it is important also for uh, looking at the vulnerability of uh, the, the various sectors, various population segments, how do we bring in women into uh, the climate change action, how do we uh, bring in youth, for example, into climate change action, and that becomes very important as well. So the, the, in that, the role of the secretariat, NDC secretariat becomes important. Looking at the wide range of actors and players who are in the climate action field and how they come together, how can we mobilize the resources collectively and also implement the programs and monitor and, and, and uh, track the, the, the changes. So the secretariat picture that I'm putting it is actually an institutional development action. We are slowly building the secretariat in terms of the capacity, in terms of various actions they can contribute, but working with the Committee on, Center, uh, Committee on Environmental Protection, which is equivalent to the Ministry of uh, Climate Change or Environment for 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 Tajikistan, right? So, so I mean, just yeah. so I just want a quick remark. I don't know, but we're still on the first slide, so I don't know if that's ah. okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No is problem. It, no problem. Is the slide changing? No, actually, we, we're still on the first uh, on your first one. I'm so I sorry. Think you need to put it on presentation mode. Uh huh. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, there are interesting pictures I wanted to bring in. Um, Click on slideshow and slide down and put it in slideshow mode. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do now. How is it looking now? No, now we're seeing the last slide is all. <laughs> uh, last slide now. Yeah. It's not moving? No, up at the top there where it says slideshow, click on that. We can also share your slides from here. Uh, can you do that uh, from your yeah. side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. It's quickly. I will show there some pictures, interesting pictures, what's happening in Tajikistan. Please go ahead and you do that from your side. I think that my problem is I'm I'm using two monitors. So probably I'm I'm not coordinating it well. Um, Tell me if you want me to move the. Which slide is this now you're showing? Inception ah, okay. workshop. So inception workshop. I was I was actually on that point. Now you can move. So we brought together the multi-sectoral people uh, in different sectors, and now uh, this slide is what I was talking about. How do we bring the institutional capacity to the committee on environmental protection through various uh, action uh, areas uh, in terms of project management uh, uh, and resource mobilization, and also monitoring and tracking um, the 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 progress we make. Next slide, please. Thank you for doing that. Um, so in the context of uh, what we are implementing right now um, uh, on the ground, a step-by-step -step process where we uh, bring together the action that the sectoral ministries are already taking, how do we bring them together in a coordinated manner to, uh, to have impact on the climate change arena and also set priorities for moving forward. Right, And in that process, build the capacity and learn from the experiences, develop best practices so that we can share it not only with the other uh, countries in Central Asia, but also at the regionally and, and, and at the global level. Next slide, please. 
So, yeah, I want to just give an example of the Tajikistan's progress, you know, in the in the short period in the last one year. And Tajikistan was able to actually take its issues, constraints and challenges, and also its own um, resource mobilization activities at the global level. For example, uh, we were able to help uh, Tajikistan in establishing, working with CARIC, which is this Central Asia um, Center for Economic uh, um, Action, they set up a pavilion at COP27. I just want to give this from Tajikistan to the regional and the, and the global level. And um, it attracted a lot of people in, in Egypt, COP27. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a result of the pavilion, which is the first time that Tajikistan had its pavilion at this international arena, uh, Senator John Kerry visited the pavilion. And in fact, he was able to have the discussion with the, the chairman of uh, uh, Committee on Environmental Protection Tajikistan on the issues that uh, Tajikistan faces and how Tajikistan can play a role in global kind of uh, uh, networks and, and, and pledges. One of the things that we discussed, the, the, that was discussed is this global, global methane pledge, for example, how Tajikistan can be partner with that program uh, as well. So what, what, what it is, uh, uh, what is important is what do we learn from the country level how do we take this to other countries at, and at the global level is fundamentally important so that the, the, the South South learning can happen as well. In the context of CASI Asia that I mentioned, Tajikistan provides us a very good uh, opportunity to learn what can be done and how we can mobilize country level capacities to implement programs on the ground. Next slide, please. So I will I'll stop in next few minutes. This is some of the pictures of Tajikistan Pavilion where several side events took place and, and, and uh, Tajikistan was able to place itself in the global arena as a key uh, climate change player, as well as uh, the mobilizer of resources within the country, as well as work with other partners in the region. Next slide, please. So in addition to working with the capacity development aspects, we are also developing evidences. We are also developing uh, 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 you know, analytical capacity by working together with the local uh, colleagues and various aspects of uh, mapping the stakeholders and see who is doing what and how we can bring them together and also studying the vulnerabilities and what are the impacts that climate change acts, what are the various frameworks that we can use to study what is happening in, in uh, Tajikistan and also bringing the mainstreaming and integrating the sectoral strategies, uh, for example, the agriculture strategy with the NDC implementation plan, for example, all these things are happening right now. So we'll be, um, you know, in the future, look forward uh, on the on our websites, CASI Asia website or CASI global.org is a website to look for uh, this information from Tajikistan on climate change and food systems. Uh, let me stop here. If, uh, if we can add, you know, talk about it in the context of question and answer. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you so, so much, uh, Suresh. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Ambassador Alan Mustard. So we was a U.S. ambassador to Turkmenistan from January 2015 to June 2019. Uh, he's a career uh, foreign service officer with the Foreign Agricultural Service, and he previously served as chief of the agricultural section at the U.S. embassies in New Delhi, New Mexico City, Moscow, and Vienna, uh, at the U.S. Consulate General in Istanbul, and as assistant agricultural attaché in Moscow under the Soviet Union. Ambassador Mustard is a graduate of Grace Herber College and uh, at the, the University of Washington, he holds an MS from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a certificate in Russian from Leningrad State University. Alan, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is thank yours. You, thank you, Sebastian. And it's a pleasure to be here and to see Jocelyn again. Uh, after my sojourn abroad, we haven't seen each other in ages. and. Uh, wonderful to meet Suresh. Um, I want to give you a snapshot uh, of food security in both Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, uh, not as an academic, uh, but as uh, an on-the-ground practitioner. I'm an agricultural economist by training, as, as uh, Sebastian mentioned, uh, and I was trained at USDA to observe crops to observe the reality on the ground and then to contrast and compare that with official statistics. 
And the reason that USDA does this is because as Mark Twain once said, there are lies, damned lies and statistics. Uh, many governments either hide statistics or they distort statistics and we go to the ground to find out what the truth is. Uh, I will point out Turkmenistan does not make its annual statistical handbook available publicly. And it has hidden the results of the periodic population censuses that have been run for the last decade and a half. So uh, much of what we know about food insecurity in Turkmenistan in particular is uh, thanks to on the ground observation. Now we start, when we look at food insecurity from the standpoint of an agricultural economist, we look at the size of the population and then at the harvest levels of major crops coupled with imports and exports. This is particularly important in countries where surveys are either inhibited or prohibited as they are in certain parts of Central Asia. So in the interest of time and avoiding confusion, I'm going to focus on one primary staple commodity and that is wheat on its availability in these two countries. Now Tajikistan actually has reasonably good statistics thanks to the presence of the World Food Program and the USAID mission in that country which collect data. The total population of Tajikistan is estimated at around 10 million but that figure is a bit deceptive because close to a quarter of that number, about two and a half million, are actually in Russia as guest workers. Uh, they are there because just under 30% of Tajikistan's gross domestic product is based on remittances from these guest workers. So we can take them out of the food equation since they are not resident in Tajikistan most of the time they are in Russia. Now, Tajikistan is mountainous. Much land area is unsuitable for agriculture. Only about 5% of the land is arable. And though agriculture accounts for half of employment and 20% of gross domestic product, productivity is low. So the major cash crops are traditionally cotton and wheat. Now, if we look at wheat production, Tajikistan produces about 800,000 metric tons of wheat per year, which is not enough. In most years, <laughs> Tajikistan imports well over a million tons of wheat, typically about 1.1, 1.2 million tons, mostly from Kazakhstan, which is nearby, and a little bit from Russia and Uzbekistan. So more than half of the bread baked in Tajikistan comes from abroad. This is characteristic of the food economy overall. Roughly half of all food consumed in Tajikistan is imported. In 2018, wheat imports cost $173 million, not a massive amount of money for a population uh, counted in the millions. In 2020, wheat imports cost $272 million, a more than 50% increase due to the rising costs of inputs, especially fuel and fertilizer, as COVID-19 disrupted supply chains. These rising costs put strain on Tajikistan, which is the poorest country in Central Asia. Now the World Food Program conducts food security assessments. The most recent was in November, 2021, or excuse me, September, 2021. It showed that 23% of households in Tajikistan were food insecure, mainly due to economic vulnerability. Now, 2 million tons of wheat, which if you combine total production and total imports of wheat would theoretically produce 1.4 million tons of flour. In other words, it would produce about 1.4 million loaves, one kilo loaves of bread. But USDA estimates that 450,000 tons is fed to livestock because it's not of milling quality. This means that in round numbers, Tajikistan has enough wheat flour to produce about a million tons of bread per year. That works out to roughly 130 to 140 kilograms of bread per person, which on the face of it seems okay. That seems an adequate amount. But bear in mind that it all depends on how affordable it is in a very poor country with widespread poverty. And bear in mind also that in Tajikistan, as in most poor countries, bread is the most important component of the diet. It is the major source of calories. The bottom line here is that food security in Tajikistan, as in most countries, is an economic problem. 
Tajik agriculture is neither large enough nor productive enough to feed the country's population, even if a quarter of it lives abroad. The country needs to import food and to ensure sufficient prosperity for its population that everyone can afford to eat. Now I'll turn to Turkmenistan, where I lived for four and a half years, and uh, where in addition to being ambassador, I was also the de facto agricultural officer uh, doing observation of the cotton and the wheat crops. Turkmenistan is a desert country and only 4% of its land area is arable. All crops are irrigated 100%. So agriculture really only exists in the oases, such as along rivers and canals. Turkmenistan has four major river valleys, two of them with alluvial fans, and of course the Karakum Canal, which draws water from the Amu Darya. If water from these rivers declines, which comes back to what uh, Dr. Babu was talking about, climate change and its impact on water availability. So if water from these rivers declines, Turkmen agriculture suffers. The official statistics bear virtually no relation to reality, so I will discuss them only in passing. Turkmenistan claims a population of over 6 million and to produce well over a million tons of wheat per year. Both figures are highly suspect. In July 2021, opposition media quoted anonymous sources inside the government as estimating the population at between 2.7 and 2.8 million, which seems reasonable given that we know roughly 2 million Turkmen have migrated abroad to look for work since 2015. Similarly, in 2018, anonymous sources advised that the wheat harvest was only 538,000 tons, nowhere close to a million or more, and 30% of it was not of milling quality, so it had to be fed to livestock. This figure was supported by trade data showing Turkmenistan imported a mix of wheat and wheat flour equivalent to over 300,000 tons of wheat. Now, if we crunch these numbers, again, I'm a practicing agricultural economist and that's what I do. If we assume a population of about 3.2 million in 2018, we get about 105 kilograms of bread or other milled wheat products per person in 2018, or a bit less than 300 grams per day. Now that's double what the average American eats in the way of bread every day. But it's, again, in a poverty-stricken economy where bread is the major source of calories, that is not very much. Now, furthermore, we see, we see other signals that since 2018, the price of government subsidized bread has doubled from one manat per loaf to two manats per loaf. Bread lines began to form about that time and have continued to this day. The issue in Turkmenistan is, despite official silence, a series of crop failures due to the lack of irrigation water. Temperatures are rising due to climate change, reduced precipitation in the watersheds is ensuing, and we have a reduced flow of the Amu Daria for the past three to four years. This has all been compounded by very poor water management. We know there is food insecurity despite the government's reluctance to acknowledge it based on reports in the opposition press and by human rights organizations. Now, according to official statistics in 2019, over half of the average Turkmen family's income was spent on food. In the lowest income quintile, it was almost two thirds. Food prices have risen since then, so pressure on family budgets is intense. Now the amount of money needed for food imports is not large because the population is not large. In 2019, Turkmenistan's food imports totaled $833 million. Now to put that in perspective, export earnings in that year, mostly from natural gas and other hydrocarbons, equaled over $11 billion. So Turkmenistan's government has the money to pay for imports of food to feed its population. Food insecurity exists in Turkmenistan, basically due to economic mismanagement. And I'll stop there. I think uh, it's time to go to the Q&A. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you so much. And so indeed, yes, we, we, have, uh, we have questions. Uh, the first one is, so, uh, well, there are, of course, many factors which impact food security, and uh, we don't have time, of course, to address all of them now, but one is uh, the growing inequality in access to land and the ability to live from farming. 
uh, which are, are the root of rural poverty and food insecurity. I was, uh, I mean, uh, some uh, one of our attendees asked if you could elaborate a little bit on uh, this issue related to the inequality in access to land. Well, the problem in Turkmenistan is that the land still belongs to the government. And uh, it, the problems with agricultural productivity have had less to do with access to the land than with the structure of the Soviet style production system. Uh, farmers don't own the land and they are still beholden to the government for state orders. The other problem is that all the inputs are provided by the government, uh, but uh, in the form of a credit, which has to be repaid when the crop is produced. And one of the reasons we've seen wheat production collapse in Turkmenistan to the degree that it has is because farmers were shortchanged on water deliveries starting about, about five years ago, really. Many of them then ended up owing the government money for the inputs, the fuel, the fertilizer, the seeds. They were unable to repay because the crop failed due to lack of water delivery for irrigation. And they simply stopped farming. They simply said, we're going abroad. This is one of the things that spurred the, the out migration of a lot of Turkmen farmers over the, the last four years. So you simply don't have farmers producing the wheat. Uh, and that's led to a lot of the poverty. Um, in terms of other factors, of course, there are other factors, including uh, the, the state orders, um, delays in payment, all of that. But it really is uh, an indication that the entire system of production agriculture needs to be modernized, needs to be brought to a more economically rational system than the old Soviet style command economy. Thank you, Alan. So, Jocelyn, so if you want to add anything on that? Uh, I didn't want to add anything. I noticed there's a question about children um, and I, mm. didn't, I want, didn't want to pass that by. You know, children, women and children are disproportionately affected uh, by food security globally. So it's a question. Um, and I, yeah, I hesitate before I say this answer because it's going to sound like I'm a passing, but um, the Food and Agriculture Organization, our goal is to work with countries to ensure their governments are, you know, provide food security. Now, those that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, Alan and Ambassador Mustard talked a lot about <laughs> Uh, where governments are and, you know, throwbacks to farmer times. And, you know, there's a lot of intricacies in politics that go along in agriculture. Um, so I wanted to say that in response, we don't do direct interventions with children. Um, we're not a direct feeding uh, country, but we do shine the light on, you know, we do bring up different indicators regarding uh, uh, malnutrition and uh, prevalence of undernourishment and chronic food um, insecurity. Now, again, in, in uh, Central Asia, from the data we have, and I think uh, Dr. Mustard's point is well taken, that the data we have is not always the best data, and that's an understatement, but the data we have is that, um, you know, there's not the same acute food insecurity for children in Central Asian countries, with the exception of Afghanistan, um, as there is, for example, in Somalia or Ethiopia, uh, where you're really um, seeing those tr sort of traditional pictures of children who, you know, who's, who's, who are very, um, uh, you know, who are on the verge of famine. Um, and yeah, so I don't know if there's, an, there's another question um, regarding well, the war in Ukraine impacting food security in Tajikistan, but I think maybe, um, I mean, I'm happy to try to answer that or I can- Yes, please. I mean, actually, uh, uh, no, I mean, if you, if you don't mind, just uh, before sure. uh, one more uh, question, because so you, you addressed indeed the question on children. One more question, if one of you could say a few words about the stunting among, among children. I mean, uh, for example, uh, Suresh or Alan or uh, just you might know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that for uh, Gorn and Badarshan uh, in Tajikistan has a very high rate, I mean, which is at about 30% of uh, 
child stunting yeah. compared to other regions where rates are already high, but uh, they are lower. It's, uh, well, well Gordon so Bodak Shan yeah. is, is, of course, the poorest area and, and is going to have the highest uh, stunting rates. Generally, across Tajikistan, they had been coming down until uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, it was down around, uh, nationally, it was down around 5% of, of Tajik children were stunted. Uh, which is a tremendous improvement over what it had been in the in the past ten to twenty years. Um, I don't. I haven't seen new statistics uh, since the the war in Ukraine broke out. But I suspect what we'll see is stunting has has gone back up somewhat, uh, but we just don't know by how much. But stunting has actually been less of a problem in Tajikistan the last few years uh, because of the improvements in diets. Suresh, did you want to add anything? Or? No, I, I think um, I, I agree with uh, Alan. The, the, uh, what numbers Alan talked about, you know, the, they, these are the real numbers on the ground. And, and in terms of uh, he, he converted the wheat imports and the wheat production numbers and, and the nationally um, available information into the per capita availability information. So that gives us a broader picture to look at, but at the same time, stunting and, and other nutritional indicators, uh, particularly tell the story about what happens at the individual level, right? And again, as uh, Alan said, the, these things have been improving. Um, as an observer of Central Asian food and nutrition security over the last 25 years, uh, I see uh, quite a bit of improvement. Uh, and but then shocks are always there, like whether it's a climate shock or or uh, the shock due to Ukraine war. Um, so how do we handle that in terms of building up the resilience? Require um, the reforms, institutional and 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 uh, as we move along, how, how do we help markets to function better? How do we connect the farmers to the markets? How do we incentivize the farmers to produce more uh, locally as well as bring them to the market? How do we help the value chains, for example, and how these value chains uh, can contribute back to the nutritional uh, intake and dietary patterns changes? And we talked about the heavy dependence on calories, right? The comparison uh, Alan gave compared to the U.S. Uh, intake of bread. That's a that's a good story to tell. So the dietary diversity uh, um, has to improve, but that requires also going beyond wheat as a main you know mm -hmm. uh, caloric uh, uh, food mm -hmm. so um, how do we then strengthen the local research institutions strengthen the uh, institutions that have uh, that distribute water for example water user associations so that uh, the value chains can be improved and they can be connected to the markets and that in turn contributes to the nutritional availability and dietary di diversity of the vulnerable population so that's the broader issue that we are looking at in Tajikistan in the in the context of agricultural development strategy. And again, connecting that with development of the markets, development of the, the intervention that uh, um, relates to water conservation. The Amudaria River question comes up all the time and how the water is uh, being shared among the countries, what's happening with the content of the water itself, you know, how much is available. So water management techniques, uh, adoption by the farmers and managing water in, in the community level becomes very important. That requires, again, institutional development, institutional capacity, and, uh, and further technology development in terms of water management. So it's a kind of a bringing together several sectors together, not just the food. Food is a problem, food security is a problem, nutrition is a problem, but the solutions have to come from different, uh, different uh, sectors, multi-sectors. Thank you, Suresh. So, uh, yeah, le let's move maybe to uh, the questions on, on Ukraine. I mean, so, uh, on the impact of the mm -hmm. of Russia's war in Ukraine, how you assess uh, that did that already have an impact on food security uh, in the region and maybe especially on the two countries we're focusing on today in Tajikistan and Turkmenistan? Yeah, I mean, the main impact has been on the price of, of, of inputs and on uh, the price of wheat. What we saw when the war broke out was uh, initially a 50% increase in the cost of wheat globally. And of course, since Kazakhstan is the major supplier of wheat to both Tajikistan and, and Turkmenistan in terms of their import picture, um, Kazakhstan, uh, the price of Kazakhstani wheat went up. Uh, by quite a bit. Uh, as I mentioned, in the case of, uh, of Tajikistan, it was due to COVID, but then beyond COVID's impact, 
in 2020. We saw an even greater increase in 2022 uh, due, due to that. So uh, the main thing was price impact. Another problem, of course, is that Kazakhstan was traditionally a supplier of diesel fuel uh, to Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Uh, Kazakhstan began uh, having shortages of diesel fuel on its own, and as a result, uh, the cost of motor fuels. Uh, anybody who's ever done any farming, you know how important diesel is for running irrigation pumps, for running your tractors, for running combines, everything. So that was an impact. And then, uh, of course, the uh, the general cost of fertilizer, which has just skyrocketed. Uh, fertilizer prices roughly doubled um, as a result of the war in Ukraine. So since fertilizer constitutes about 30% of the cost of production of wheat and of corn, um, it's, 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 a major, it's a major cost and, and that had an impact as well. Basically it means prices went up and that of course has an impact on the forest. Yeah. I just want to add to that, that, you know, the war in Ukraine followed COVID. And so you've had this double shock here, right? And, you know, the world was just sort of kind of um, getting back on its feet around COVID uh, last February. We we're just coming out of the Delta and Omicron variants and, you know, but um, so while the war in Ukraine, certainly a major shock to major agriculture producers at war with each other for the first time since 1945. We haven't had this situation since, you know, for 70 years, essentially. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a one-two punch, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, that's how FAO is, you know, countries were just recovering, just coming out of the economic downturns due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, of course, many of those countries, including the United States, were having major, you know, uh, governmental um, social protection programs in the area of food stamps and things like that. So there was a lot of money flowing around in the countries from government support, and then comes these higher prices. So the whole the whole landscape has has shifted a lot. Um, and in Central Asia, I mean, I will turn to to Alan and Suresh uh, for being more specific. Um, on those countries there, but as wheat importing countries, um, and you know, then of course there's going to be a, a major hit. I think every country is 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 still dealing with um, the impacts of the war. Although going back, also I mentioned rice in the in the my presentation, not because Central Asia is rice based, but anytime you anytime one commodity is majorly affected by something others come in. So there could be substitutions, there can be uh, farmers will pivot to growing more rice if, if, it's, if it's possible, or they'll pivot to other commodities. So I think, you know, the next few months will, um, the next year will, t will tell us more about what these impacts have had. Yeah, one more quick uh, question uh, again on the impact of the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that uh, there will be a drop in remittances in the next three or six months, which would uh, probably indeed impact food security in the region, especially, for example, in Tajikistan, where so many Tajiks, uh, with so many Tajiks working every year in Russia? Uh, that depends on uh, the impact of uh, sanctions on the Russian economy. Um, mm. And at this point, the Russian economy is still projected to have slow growth. Uh, it's not con uh, projected to contract over the next year, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. We just, that's one of those things that uh, my, my crystal ball is pretty cloudy right now when it comes to what's going to happen with Russia. Mm. And uh, that's the factor to watch. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, we have some questions about uh, the methodology on uh, uh, to assess food uh, security or food insecurity. The first one may be for Jocelyn, but I mean uh, for everybody actually, which is uh, given uh, the limited data collection access to, uh, oh no, actually no, this first one is probably more for, for Alan, sorry. Uh, given the limited data collection access <clears throat> in Turkmenistan, excuse me, how is your organization well able to track performance indicators on food security programs? And the second question is how useful would opinion data be in assessing the food situation in Turkmenistan and Tajikistan? 
and all the Central Asian countries. Uh, despite the difficulties and limits of such surveys, as you already noted, there are some like the uh, Central Asian barometer, which try to, to work on that, but to uh, measure more accurately, you would of course need to use very sophisticated uh, question techniques. So what do you think about uh, this opinion data to, to assess food security in Central Asia? Who, whom are you asking, Sebastian? Anyone, <laughs> anyone <laughs> wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I, 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 maybe Alan, you can talk about Turkmenistan data issue, but uh, definitely on Tajikistan, USAID has been investing uh, considerably over the last 10 years and continues to invest in data collection. And uh, it's one country where we have um, collected data in the Feed the Future uh, region, uh, the region of influence. And uh, the data is still being collected. And uh, thanks to USAID's investment there. So we do have on the ground farming lab, farm level, also level data that is revealing the actual situation on, on food security and, and, and it not just the national level, but all, at the household level, we are able to tell what's happening uh, in terms of gender uh, inequality, as well as in, 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 in the food consumption, nutrition consumption, the status of children and, and so on. That As we speak, the USAID supported work is happening on the field in data collection. So uh, that, Ability to collect data at the household level, um, support that we receive from, from that end is fundamental for generating evidence. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, we'll be talking, <laughs> we'll be talking in the larger broad sense, but what interventions uh, we can, we can uh, design and, uh, and, and implement depends on the evidence. And uh, so Tajikistan yeah. has done much better than other countries, I would say. And thanks to USAID, uh, uh, colleagues there have been very supportive of uh, data collection and evidence-based uh, implementation of uh, interventions. Yeah, in Turkmenistan, the data simply don't exist. Uh, and uh, surveys are, are stopped by the government. So uh, basically prohibited. So uh, they're, they're, it, it's not possible to go out and do the types of, of surveys uh, of households that we would normally uh, expect either USAID or FAO or, or uh, some World Food Program to go out and do. Uh, so we simply don't have the data. We have the macro data to some degree as, as I uh, presented them. But again, <laughs> those are based on, uh, and to some degree, anecdotal observations uh, simply because the official statistics uh, can't be trusted. So do you think that, for example, Alan, the FAO and USAID work with the Turkmen government to maybe to try to improve the statistical capacity of the, of the country? I'm asking, we, we just received this question, actually. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem of statistical capacity. I think they have reasonably good statisticians, but I think it's a government policy uh, not to publish statistics. Uh, and it's a government policy to to hide the actual situation in the country to the degree possible. I mean, I also okay. wanted to note that, um, so there's a lot of questions around why doesn't the UN do this or why doesn't the UN do that? Um, we have a, an office in Turkmenistan, I just looked it up. Um, we have an office in Tajikistan. We have our representatives there are supposed to work with the government on their priorities. But again, if a government is gonna be closed, um, or doesn't want to present data, then you know it's not like we have an enforcement tool to say you must present this data. We do the best we can. I I know you know some countries are easier than others to work with. Um, during COVID, I was the representative to both Ghana and Zimbabwe, and those two countries had very different approaches to data and to openness um, of those data. You you know you 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 work with the Ministry of Agriculture and related ministries the best you can to push them, to encourage them, to demonstrate that these are important um, important global tools, but um, there's no real enforcement tool that, that the United Nations has. Yeah, in that, context, I, in that context, yes, I should say ahead. Tajikistan is um, a bit more open in terms of data collection, and uh, we do need to build some capacity, of course, in data analysis. You know, how do you interpret the data that you collect? 
from uh, from so ifpri has been working with usaid mission in in tajikistan uh, for quite some time to build this capacity as well as to bring the data from from the ground and um, and then connecting that evidence to policy making so that that culture of evidence based policy making has to be nurtured um, and that takes time it's <laughs> it's not overnight uh, turnaround it takes time and uh, and also telling stories as alan kind of nicely to told the stories of food security you know from the numbers that you get is very important policy communication is very important when uh, when you get a chance to communicate that policy with the ministers deputy ministers uh, and emphasize the importance of evidence based policy making uh, mm -hmm. it becomes um, a useful tool for making progress and and if pre are particularly uh, as we are a research organization we have been working with the governments as well as um, donors particularly usaid mission in tajikistan has been uh, very helpful in terms of going to the field and because uh, tajikistan was a future the future country so it was a very good investment that they made in terms of collecting the data using the data for um designing the strategies now new new uh, agricultural development strategy is being talked about and if pre and usaid mission there are working closely with the with the ministry there yeah i just wanted to point out there are when the policy window opens we should make use of that to to get mm -hmm. this evidence based policies uh, uh, uh working so that's it's a long term effort but we have to be there yeah thank you suresh uh, well, I, I have a question on uh, the geography of food security inside the countries we are uh, addressing today. Uh, are there some regions in Tajikistan and Turkmenistan which are more affected than others by food insecurity and, and why? Um, well, I think we've talked about Gorna Badakhshan in, mm. in Tajikistan just because it's a poverty, uh, an impoverished region. Um, in Turkmenistan, uh, there is no specific place that is necessarily worse than any other. It is, has more to do with income distribution than anything else. Um, I remember visiting the southern part of Balkan uh, province, which is very close to the border with Iran. It's a, a very arid region. There, there's virtually no water there for irrigation. Uh, what drinking water is there is uh, is uh, from desalination of Caspian seawater, and uh, it's a fairly impoverished region. Where uh, when we went to the market, we said, "Where does all this food come from?" They said, "It comes from Ashgabat. Uh, trucks come in from Ashgabat and deliver it." And if it was too expensive for people to afford, then they lived off of bread, whatever they could get. So uh, again, you're 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 just dealing with. Uh, the, the income distribution more than a geographic distribution. And these countries are not that large. Um, so movement within the countries is, is relatively easier than it is in, in a large expanse. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just to add to that just a little bit on a, sort of on a global scale that, you know, until now, um, food insecurity, I mean, for the last, three or four decades, food insecurity has been an, an access issue, issue. We have produced enough food in the world. It's a question of people having the income to purchase it. What FAO is looking at now, as a combination of climate change and these conflicts, is that we may may, and I don't want to scare anyone or do any, you know, um, anything that's too doom and gloom, but we may have an availability issue coming up because of the change. If we don't address climate change, then countries that are particularly vulnerable to climate change, such as Central Asia, where water is such a, is so scarce, um, uh, you know, then we, we really may be in a, an availability issue. That's something that FAO is watching very carefully. But I want to echo what, what um, Alan said is that until now, food insecurity has really been uh, uh, an access, what we call an affordability issue. Um, if, I, if I could just uh, add on to that, uh, I recommend highly to people the Asian Development Bank's climate risk assessments, which are available on the Asian Development Bank website, which uh, paint a very scary picture of water availability for irrigation in Central Asia between now and 2050. We're already seeing 
that uh, availability of water for irrigation is uh, declining uh, and it's going to be very severely affected uh, in another couple of decades. Hmm. And Thanks it strikes right at the heart of Jocelyn's point. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Alan. So we have only a few minutes left, but uh, we have, uh, when, when we talk about food security in Central Asia, we also need to consider what all the countries around Central Asia are, are doing. And we have a question on uh, Afghanistan, which uh, uh, is going to build a 400 kilometers canal from the Amud Darya, which according to this plan will take a third of uh, the Amud Darya water. Uh, so, which means that it would uh, have a big impact on water resources in, in Central Asia. So uh, how would you assess that? And do you have any information on who will coordinate this project and how this will be coordinated? I, I personally don't know how the project's gonna be coordinated. I can give you some other tech, I can give you some other inf information. You know, about 14% of Afghanistan's land is arable. It's mostly in the North and I mean, and the North is the part that's been um, irrigated many, many times now. Irrigation is not just sort of a magic, you don't just irrigate and then let it walk away. You ha it ha there's maintenance, there's policies around it of who gets the water and things like that. So um, all I can say is, I, again, I don't know this particular project, mm. but um, this sounds like a very uh, an endeavor that will that could change the course of production of wheat in those countries um, dramatically, and um, we may get into water rights uh, uh, arguments um, quickly over that, given how dry these countries are and how limited the water availability is. Yeah. One thing we haven't mentioned is the role of cotton in all of this. Uh, the desiccation of the Aral Sea as a result of, of uh, cotton monoculture in uh, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan during the Soviet period. And um, Uzbekistan produces about 5 million tons of cotton a year, Turkmenistan somewhere about a million, um, Tajikistan about 300,000 tons of cotton a year. And uh, cotton is one of the thirstiest crops out there. It just absorbs tremendous amounts of water uh, to produce. And uh, frankly, I think if we're going to be moving into an era of restricted water availability, uh, these countries need to start moving away from producing cotton. Uh, they really need to stop producing cotton, start producing other crops that don't require as much as much water and which actually add to the food balance sheet because uh, uh, cotton is a wonderful crop. Uh, I wear cotton clothing, but you can't eat it. And um, we're heading in, in a direction where we need to start thinking more about food crops rather than industrial crops. Thank you so much. And so we're really getting close to, to the end. We have only two minutes left. Uh, so maybe to conclude, uh, so I mean, uh, Jocelyn and uh, Suresh especially talked a lot about how the international community is involved. But as, do you consider, I mean, that's a question for the three of you, would there be some initiatives from the international community that have been not, that have not been launched yet and that would be worth exploring to, to contribute to, to food security uh, in the region in general and uh, in Turkmenistan, Tajikistan in particular? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, uh, we need to look at, at better water conservation, get away from flood irrigation, move more, uh, more towards uh, drip where it's appropriate and at least go to uh, sprinkler irrigation. Uh, that would help a lot with water conservation. Um, move away from government control of the agriculture sector, move, move more towards government support but with private entrepreneurship in the agriculture sectors. Mm -hmm. Suresh, do you want to add anything? Yeah, thank you, Alan, that's, that's very good. Yeah, I, in that context, I want to just continue this. this. There was a uh, comment about food, energy, water nexus, and that's where these issues of climate change and building resilience of the farmers become very important. And in that context, and, and, and also, uh, leading to food security and natural resource management in a sustainable way. So serious issues related to water has to be addressed. That's where this integrated approach of multi-sectoral coming together, looking at 
how we can build the resilience of the farming system, moving, um, the changing the cropping pattern, for example. Uh, an example is moving from cotton to food crops and other va value addition and other crops that they can actually earn more money in terms of uh, uh, commercial crops, uh, it, it will be very important to, to do that. But climate change and addressing that uh, gives us a, as an entry point, a uh, quick entry point at the policy level, because policymakers are open to climate change interventions as well as in Tajikistan. Also wanted to mention that um, uh, Mr. Matt Curtis from USAID embassy uh, in uh, USAID mission in Tajikistan mentioned that DH, DHS data will be collected this year um, in Tajikistan. So that gives new data for looking at the Ukrainian you know, challenge, uh, the war, that situation, and its impact. Um, I just saw that uh, comment from that. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Justine, do you want to add a final word before uh, we conclude? Just echo, um, echo my esteemed colleague's points. Um, one a little bright spot is that um, there is the first UN water conference coming up in later this month. Um, so the first time countries are going to come together and talk about water issues, which has not happened in 46 years. So, uh, you know, again, I know it's another UN conference, but at least getting that point up, um, you know, in, in the, the discussion point and FAO is going to be developing a strategy around water. Um, so, you know, and water and agriculture, I think it's also important that agriculture has now a place in the climate change discussions, uh, the COP discussions in the first COP, while the, the one in Glasgow agriculture was not discussed at all. In Sharm El Sheikh, it was discussed and um, in the UAE, it should be discussed more. So ensuring that agriculture gets integrated into these discussions, I think is, is really important. And um, yeah, and for advocates, uh, you know, on the phone here and others to understand and um, that, you know, th things like soil mapping, where you go around and measure what the soils are, it's not the most glamorous work, um, but it's fundamental to understanding to Alan's point of, you know, what crops can Central Asian countries grow that are, um, that are, you know, that good for their soil and that don't um, require too much water. So again, some of the some of the fixes aren't as glamorous as we'd, we'd like them to be, but I'd like our listeners to be open to them. Thank you so much. So unfortunately, we, we need to conclude. So I would like to thank our panelists for sharing with us their huge knowledge on this uh, so important topic, which uh, as uh, we show today is really at the intersection of so many issues as the discussion could go on. But as I said, we're gonna try to organize another event on food security in all the Central Asian countries. So I would like to thank again our panelists for being with us today, for their presentation, for their questions. I would, uh, I would also like to thank our attendees for all the questions, for your participation in the, the discussion and we look forward to seeing you again in one of our upcoming Central Asia program seminars. So thank you again. Have a good day or have a good uh, afternoon or a good evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.